And that is uh, in place and we're ready to roll. So once again, thanks everybody for joining me tonight. We've got uh, several issues that, little issues, little things we want to discuss with you. And, but mostly we want to have time to see if there's anything on your mind, anything we should be concerned about, any, any issues that we should be addressing as a group. And uh, make sure that we're, uh, we're addressing uh, any of those, those questions. But uh, first we have a little good news. Uh, Gary asked me the question, how many shift supervisors do we have? And the answer to that is we have four more than we did, did a couple of weeks ago. We have four new shift supervisors with us. Uh, three of them are with us tonight. And I wanted to start off by just introducing you to those who are the new shift supervisors so you know who they are and begin to be able to associate names and faces if you have not already seen these, these uh, uh, active members in the past. Uh, and I've asked each one of them just to take just a couple moments and introduce themselves, just tell about what they've been doing in the, in the shop and uh, hold up here, we got some sound going on. I was not anticipating. Dallas, can you mute everyone else? I'm going to. Okay, do I still have voice? Let's see here. I think I'm still on. Give me a thumbs up. There we go. Okay. So anyhow, uh, I wanted to allow each of them to introduce themselves uh, tonight. Uh, each one of them has been participating in the, in the shop and helping out. Uh, but I, I think it's best if you get a chance to hear their voice and see them. Uh, I'm going to start off with Oi Ling. Oi Ling Kwan has been, uh, many of you have seen her around the shop. She's got that big smiling face and she's always working on something. You see her uh, a, a lot of times at the holiday build and, and in a lot of the activities. So I'm going to, if I can find her on the screen, actually, uh, Oileen, can you unmute yourself? Maybe I can unmute you. Are you there? Okay. Yes, okay, great. Okay, uh, my name is Oileen. And um, I'm one of the first uh, students you have in your class for the introductory to woodworking classes. Um, that was about three plus years ago. And um, since then, I've taken other classes, both from the wood shop as well as from Palomar College. I took the um, woodworking class 100 at Palomar College with uh, Paul Dersham, and I just finished the hand joinery class with Jennifer. And um, like uh, Dallas was saying, I've been doing some of the holiday built and toy working uh, group. Um, I've also done some TA in various uh, introductory class. Um, currently I'm working on some uh, Christmas built uh, with the uh, reindeers and uh, so that's about it. <laughs> I enjoy working with everybody. Okay and I, I will note also that uh, Oi Ling and the next person you're going to meet is Mark Humphreys but the two of them have been taking on a activity on every other Sunday afternoon or I think it's every other Sunday afternoon where they're doing sorry. finishing on the toy, uh, I'm sorry, on the uh, holiday build. So projects that are partially completed but need some sanding, finishing. They're leading a group of uh, newer members that may, uh, may not have the ability to do a lot of things at home or don't have a shop to do it, and just finishing up projects for us. Oiling and, and Mark are leading that effort every other uh, Sunday afternoon. So Mark, let's uh, move to you. I'm going to... Uh, Trying to unmute you. There we go. Hi everyone. Um, so I I joined about a year ago, and that's about how long I've been doing fine woodworking. I've up until then it was mostly rough carpentry type work. Um, my first project was uh, replacing all the cupboard doors in my garage. I think there were twenty. So we did sort of shaker style on that, and I I took. Uh, I just finished a hand joinery class with Oi Ling at Palomar and uh, took the 100 course, obviously. 
was hoping to take more of those. This uh, COVID's kind of messed that up for now. Um, I uh, so I've been doing more at home. I do more hand uh, joinery work um, because I don't have um, equipment yet, except for I have a drill press, but it's all hand tool work. And so I've been doing things like uh, footstools and step stools and uh, some other small projects. And oh, and for the gift build, I'm the small sushi board guy. <laughs> <laughs> I just finished my 40th one. Um, so 40. <laughs> 20 last year, 20 this year. Doug's our, our designer of those. They, they came out pretty nice. I'll also comment that Mark has also been very helpful around the shop. He's taken on a lot of special projects. He's helped us do, uh, uh, I, I won't even start to name the projects, but whenever I have a, a special project to do, Mark's one of the go-to guys and he's always there when we need him. Appreciate that. Mark. Under, under Rick's guidance. <laughs> yes. Good. Thanks, yeah. Okay. Um, and Paul Skank and Paul, here you are. Uh, get you unmuted. I think most of you know Paul from one place or another, but boy, he's been just about everywhere helping us out in Shop 2.0. I would have hated to go through that without Paul. He was uh, he was there just about all the time doing one project or another, whatever needed done. Well, if you need demolition done, I'm your guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I am um, member for a year and a half. Uh, nothing of note, just helping out on the holiday build, the toy build. I kind of like these little dive in, get it done, get out of uh, thing. Uh, I also live with my girl in North in a hundred plus year old house. So that can take some to, uh, take care of the honeydews there, but, um, uh, tool and some digital tools, uh, there and use the laser and the CNC and helping out uh, where, where I can. Well, thank you, Paul. Paul's been the been the guy who uh, he and Pat have done so much with the CNC and laser to keep us up and running. In addition to all the other work he's done around the shop, and we really appreciate that too, Paul. Thank you. Sharon uh, is going to introduce. Uh, on Rita's behalf, explain to uh, talk about uh, Rita. I secretly always thought that Sharon sounded that way. <laughs> Sharon, there's something going on with your mic. We had we had this experience with Sharon's husband Jim the other day. And I was telling Sharon about it, and she explained to me that. About one out of every 10 calls, the voice comes out like that, so. Yeah. It's really squeaky. Yeah. yeah. Mickey Sharon. <laughs> it's the helium. Okay, well, it sounds like, it looks to me like she logged out and is coming back in. While we're waiting for her to come back in, let's go on with our uh, agenda. And uh, I'm going to ask uh, our uh, our founding chairman, our our grand leader to uh, share a few thoughts with you and give you a few updates on some of the things that are going on. Well, thank you and good evening to everybody and happy August. Hard to believe that uh, it's August already and before we know it, the year is gonna be over, but uh, it's always great to be with this group. It's, I not only consider this our most important meeting, but certainly the group that's most important to, to the shop. And uh, I really miss having the opportunity to get together and see all of you in person and shake hands and slap backs like we used to. But obviously, this new lifestyle is something we're still all getting used to. And I, too, would like to uh, offer special uh, congratulations to Oiling and uh, uh, to Paul and to Mark, as well as to Rita. Uh, you're, you're a very important addition to a very important effort. And... Uh, uh, we really appreciate your willingness to take on this additional responsibility. How uh, am I now? Now you're loud and clear. Go ahead, Sharon. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm here to introduce Rita, who couldn't be here this evening. So I get to embarrass her. That'll teach her, huh? 
Um, you probably haven't seen Rita around the shop a lot, but she's the one who took everybody's pictures for posting on the wall for the shift supervisors. She is our administrative director at the shop. You may not know this, that she's actually the person who started the Tri-Dubs, the Women's Woodworking Group, but because she was still working at the time, she didn't really have the time to devote to it, so I took it over. I asked her to send me some bullet points of what to say about her, and she told me that she took her first Palomar woodworking class in 2014, so she's relatively new at this. She's recently retired as a lawyer from the California Department of Justice, where she did Medicare fraud. And she mentioned as an aside that she was a champion pole vaulter. And I thought, what? <laughs> Is she joking? So I Googled her and oh my gosh, I, I'm going to embarrass her because she's not here. Um, she has won, she holds many world records. She has won multiple gold medals for pole vaulting and the heptathlon. She won, held the world record in 2009. She was selected as the world's best female athlete of the year in 2009 by the track and field governing body internationally. Wow. It sounds like if we need someone to leap tall workbenches in a single bound, she can probably do it. So that's what I have about Rita. Wow, you, you knocked my socks off. I had no idea. I didn't either. <laughs> okay, Gary. She only weighs like 90 pounds, so she can yeah. launch herself. <laughs> The next time we need somebody to get up on the roof and handle that uh, equipment up there, Dallas, we'll know who to send up. I, I got that one down. <laughs> wow. I second that. That's kind of a hard act to follow. <laughs> anyway, the, the main thing I wanted to say tonight was thank you. Um, and I say that every meeting, and I, I mean it sincerely, and uh, we can't say it enough. But thank you to all of you. You guys are the engine that uh, drives this wonderful machine that we've built. And uh, you do it so well that it just, it's one of those things that when things are really running smoothly, you don't even think about or hear about it. And uh, I think back to my retail days where customer complaints were just, you know, part of the turf. And, uh, you know, I can't remember the last time I had a complaint on a, on a shift supervisor or anything anywhere close to it. So it speaks well. Mm -hmm not only of what you do, but the way that you do it and the level of professionalism and the people skills that you bring to the job. And um, neither Dallas nor Travis nor uh, any of the rest of us can say it enough that we just really appreciate uh, what it takes for you to do that. Um, I flipped on the camera the other day and Brian Blackshear, who I don't, I don't, didn't see him on there, but he was getting ready for his shift. And uh, that guy was running around. I, most of you are, old enough to remember the white tornado commercial, but he had a white shirt on and his white hair on. Honest to God, he looked like the white tornado blowing through that shop, cleaning things just as fast as he could go. And uh, by chance, it was my turn to do that the next day because I was gonna open the, uh, the shop for the uh, holiday build. And I got to thinking, boy, I gotta think back and remember our training. So I remember everything to clean and polish and decontaminate because I know Dallas is going to be watching the camera just to make sure that I don't miss anything. So I brushed up on my skills and I got there early and I, man, I went around there as fast as I could, although I can't hold a candle to Brian Blackshear, only to find out later that the camera system was out that morning. So Dallas didn't even have a chance to appreciate what a great job I did that morning, but it certainly reminds me of how hard all of you work to uh, keep our shop running. And again, we really appreciate it. The most important thing probably about what you do is that we've had zero serious injuries, knock on wood, since we've opened the shop in over three years. And that really is quite remarkable. And I think if any of us going into this thing were honest, we would never have guessed that we'd be that fortunate. But it's not just luck, it's because all of you have done a 
a wonderful job of keeping everybody safe and enforcing the policies and procedures that we've put in place and helped us put good logical uh, procedures and safety uh, policies in place, and they've worked. I spent an hour uh, last week on a Zoom call with uh, uh, some of the group, the Guild in Georgia. They are thinking about opening their own shop, and uh, we had quite a lively discussion. And of course, they were uh, picking my brain on, on how we went about it. Unfortunately, there's not much in that brain left to pick, but they, they gave it their best shot. But about 45 minutes into the uh, meeting, they said, well, we don't want to put you on the spot, but how many serious injuries have you had since you opened the shop? And when I told them we haven't had any, they were just blown away. And it, it really is something that all of you can and should be proud of, because uh, it really is an important accomplishment. And obviously, it's important we stay focused on, on keeping that record running. And then, of course, COVID has brought on a whole new challenge. And uh, again, I was reminded as I did my turn in the, in the bucket the other day of just how hard all of you have to work on top of what you were doing already to uh, uh, implement the uh, uh, safety procedures that uh, John and Brenda have, have helped us put in place uh, to keep everybody safe, because that really is our most important responsibility is to keep everybody safe. And uh, when you do it and you do it well as you have, it, you kind of don't think about it so much. You just take it for granted, but, but I don't. And again, I really appreciate uh, what you do and, and we want you to know it. Three quick uh, updates and uh, I'll let Dallas get back to uh, your other business. Uh, first of all, you are uh, one of our most important conduits in terms of communication to our members. So I wanna make sure you always know what's going on in the, uh, the shop. Um, so from a financial standpoint, I just want to reassure everybody we're fine. Uh, it's, it's been a, a solid year. Uh, we've had a couple of months where we've been in the red, as you might expect, but all the rest of the months have been not only in the black, but well more than the red in the other months. So uh, we're in great financial shape, continue to be in great financial shape. Uh, so you don't need to worry about money in order to any of our members do. Uh, it, worry about it. Pete and I worry about it because we still need to figure out how we're going to pay for an expansion when it comes time for shop 3.0. But uh, uh, we'll handle the worrying on that and you worry about everything else as it relates to running the shop. One of the other questions I get asked quite a bit lately is, are we going to close the shop again? And uh, I just want to reassure you, we have no plans to close the shop and no intent to close the shop. Uh, that said, uh, our goal always remains the same as to protect the safety of our members. And if we get to the point, depending on what happens with this pandemic and the way it manifests itself, that we feel we need to do that to protect the health of you and the rest of our members, then we'll certainly review that decision and, and take the appropriate steps. But uh, apparently there's a rumor going around we're going to close. And, and if we are, I'm, I'm not aware of it. And I think I'd probably know. So I uh, just wanted to share that with you. And then the other thing I just wanted to make sure everybody understands is we are going to have a holiday gift sale uh, in November, just like we have the last two years. It's an important part of our fundraising activities. Uh, we are in high gear. We have already amassed more merchandise uh, this far this year than we sold all of last year. So we're off to a great start. We're going to have plenty of merchandise. Our, <laughs> our biggest problem this year is trying to figure out how we can make sure that we sell it all because uh, Obviously, if we have the sale in the shop as we have the last two years, I'm, number one, I'm not sure where we're going to put it, particularly as it relates to the uh, new requirements we'll have relative to social distancing and routing everybody through there. So we're working on that issue. Uh, one of the suggestions was that we uh, look for another venue and uh, we talk to the church where we hold our general meetings, thinking that might be a good option. Uh, unfortunately, they're uh, pretty much shut down for the, uh, 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 because of COVID, uh, at least for the foreseeable future. They're not booking any engagements whatsoever. So uh, we'll continue to explore other possibilities. Travis has uh, taken the initiative to start up a uh, effort to put an online store on our website. Uh, we're well down the road on that. Uh, Erica Cueva and Shayla Logan are working hard to help us put that together and, and making remarkable progress. We're excited about what they're doing. 
And uh, if worse comes to worse and we can't have a physical sale, we will be in a position to at least have one online. And then there's the and or of even if we have a physical sale, we may use that as, as an adjunct uh, to that physical sale. So uh, if anybody asks you, uh, we are having a sale and, and we look forward to it and look forward to everybody's participation and support and it being as successful or more successful than it was last year. So again, thanks for all you do and uh, thanks for your time. And Dallas, with that, back to you. Okay, thank you, Gary. Um, and we have uh, our grand poobah here with us. Uh, Travis is, is with us and Travis has uh, agreed to share with you some of the things that are happening within the association. Travis? Thank you, Dallas. And uh, could you give me the ability to share the screen? I wanted to, um, it's in the security button. It's about the third item down. But as you're doing that, when Dallas asked me if I could just say a couple of things, um, I started to reflect upon the core that is shop supervisors. Um, I've been involved in maker spaces, which are a variation on a wood shop, but a, with a wider variety of um, tools. So you do metalworking and you do electronics and other things. And over the course of that decade, the model that has worked has relied very heavily on a core capable volunteer force that makes the place run. And um, in our context, we call them shop supervisors. And if we did not have shop supervisors, we would not have a shop. So it's incredible how whenever I reflect back on the community that is on this call, I think about how absolutely critical it was. If we didn't have you, we wouldn't have a shop. And so there's just a huge sense of appreciation I have as just a member of the shop who wants to go in and use it, that you guys are there making that possible. And then a few days ago, I was in the shop and uh, John Wilkinson was there with one of the introductory students. And it was like a, a small version of what I have seen a hundred times, which is a shop supervisor spending time with a member to make sure they do things safely, to teach them the right ways to do things, how to use a tool, right technique, that sort of thing. And also to be a mentor, to establish a relationship with them that helps guide them through their woodworking growth process. And I just, I'm just so appreciative as just, again, a member of the shop, somebody who comes in and needs a guidance, because you guys all know I'm a relatively new woodworker, that you guys are out there making the shop possible. And then also guiding those of us who don't know woodworking as well as you do. It's just invaluable. And so just from my heart, thank you. This is, it's just so big what you guys do it's so generous what you give to us um in the context of mentoring is where i wanted to really just bring a couple of things to your attention and to do that i'd like to share a screen which is uh, a screen that mike lewis and um jim mcgeehan put together which is our website so here we are at the website, and I want to draw your attention to this little area over here called online events. Um, here you can see the last general meeting that was done. And previously we had the lumber cycle tour. This is a tour of the facilities of lumber cycle, but I'm not drawing you here to show you those two things. I'm drawing you here to show you this. View full archive. The reason I want to draw your attention to this is so that as you are working with people and you maybe learn something that they're interested in, we have taken somewhere around 50 of our stored Zoom events and we've structured them on this page. So let's say you're dealing with somebody who turns out to have a passion for hand tools. They can come and they click on hand tools and what they're going to see is the cumulative effort that uh, Paul Duffield has done for his special interest group. And these are so far seven videos, each of them around an hour long covering some basic things like saws and sharpening, wet sharpening, spoke shaves. If you have a member that expresses an interest in hand tools or some specific aspect of hand tools, you can send them to our website 
and they can not only see what was done in the past, but they can choose to join a special, special interest group going forward. If they missed a general meeting, they can come here. They can see a general meeting. Um, let's say that they wanted to go on one of the shop tours. We've got those here. Doug is awesome, as we all know. Here we're going into the fundamentals. This is his fast start program. And he has had a series. Let's take the biggest series that he's done here. Over the course of five sessions, he's built a wall cabinet, a hanging wall cabinet, and takes us through the entire build process. So if you have a member who wants to take a project from soup to nuts and wants to also learn over the course of that process, this is a great place to come to is five sessions. He's now in the middle of a small veneer box build. Here are the first two hours and there will be more after that. So my point here is to draw your attention to the fact that we have all of these different videos from special interest groups that have been meeting over the course of the last few months. And that if you have a member that expresses an interest, then you can send them here as a resource. The second thing I wanted to bring to your attention was really a fallout of our last shop tour, which was with Lumber Cycle. For those of you who aren't familiar with Lumber Cycle, Lumber Cycle is a nonprofit whose mission it is to take urban wood and find a purpose for it so that the carbon in it can be sequestered and it won't go back into the environment. So they take felt trees and they will uh, dimensionalize them and square them up and make slabs available and basically find groups that will put that wood to good use. And one example of how they're working with us is that the holiday gift build has a bonanza of wood that was just given to us. Uh, Mike McElney is now working with them on our outreach program to do something for the new police captain. The folks at Lumber Cycle are willing to provide us with wood if it advances their mission. One way is through programs that we have. Another way is through a program they have, which is if you'll make something for them, which they can use at an auction to raise funds, then they'll give you a bunch of extra wood. So let's say you have a member that just wants to get access to wood. And just so you know, the wood is just that wood that grows in San Diego County. It's not like the world of selection. It's what is a felled tree in San Diego County that they have, have uh, processed. But if a member wants access to inexpensive wood, they can make things for lumber cycle and get extra wood for themselves. And lastly, while they're not a store that you could just go to at any time you want, if you go when they're there, you can get wood for crazy cheap prices. It's, it's, it's huge slabs, five feet tall, 24 inches wide, live edge, 35 bucks. I mean, it's like, like bonkers good deal. And uh, again, it advances Lumber Cycle's mission if they can find places where that wood can be used to sequester the carbon. So as you mentor folks, as I mean, you guys have more contact with our members than anybody, as you see them and as you see what they're interested in, these are some additional resources you can send them to, places where they can learn about topics and join special interest groups, and a resource for wood that is either going to advance our programs within the association or that they can just get cheaply or for free if they'll make things that they can use for fundraising auctions. And without you knowing that, you'd never know to bring it up. So thank you, Dallas, for giving me the opportunity to share these things with folks. But um, aside from a huge heartfelt thank you for what you guys do on a regular basis for making the shop work and keeping us safe, I wanted you to know about these two extra things. And um, with that, Dallas, I'll just turn it back to you. Thanks. Thank you, Travis. And, uh... I've got to say that the uh, the Zoom thing has really been a a, um, a great bridge for us during COVID. It it has brought us together and it has allowed us all to uh, pursue our our hobby as well as uh, <clears throat> pursue the interest of the association and fulfill some of our mission to uh, to increase the uh, the awareness of woodworking and uh, and assist in the community. So thank you, Travis, for bringing that together.
Uh, Gary mentioned the holiday build and uh, uh, Doug and uh, Doug Glessner and uh, Dan uh, are going to give you a little update on some of the things and then also uh, ask for your help in, with some recruiting. So, Doug? Thanks, Dallas. So over half of you have already contributed to some degree for the holiday build or have been coming to the holiday builds themselves. All I would ask is that as shift supervisors, as you see someone working on a project in the shop, just ask them, hey, would you consider making one of your projects, making two of them and donating one to the holiday build? Like Gary says, we have a large uh, volume of inventory, but Roy's looking for variety of projects because that's what makes our holiday build so successful. So if you see somebody out there during your shift doing something really unique, just ask them, hey, um, have you thought about making one of those for the holiday bill? And they don't even have to do it at the shop. Um, you could even be working at home and then donate it later on in late October or something as we're coming up towards the day of the sale. So variety is what made our build successful in the past. And we would just ask you that, not you personally, but as you see other uh, members come through, ask them if they would consider donating something to the shop uh, for the holiday build. Dan, you got anything else? Yeah, the only thing I'd like to add is that we're meeting in the shop every other Friday, and we have a Zoom meeting every other Friday where we discuss progress and uh, accomplishments. Exactly. Thank you. Thanks, And Ellis. everybody's invited to join. Thanks. I've got to say, Dan and Doug have really done a great job of leading that group. They have some fun. Uh, the members who are working on that thing have some fun, they, but they certainly do a lot of work. And, and the, uh, the holiday gift program is an important part of our uh, fundraising efforts, but it also uh, fits in very well with our mission for, uh, for woodworking. Uh, I've got a number of smaller items I just want to chat with everybody about, make sure that everybody's up to speed. Uh, and we're going to reserve plenty of time at the end here for you for items that you may have, but I just want to cover a few items that have come up and things that uh, you've asked me about and things we've uh, some questions about change in policy and I'd like to uh, address those tonight and then we'll do a few things in writing just so that we have it all uh, very clear what, what the expectations are. First of all, on the COVID, uh, Gary mentioned to me that, uh, or mentioned that he knows I'm on the cameras and uh, reviewing the videos. Yes, Sharon and Rick and I and Gary and others uh, do review how we're doing on, on compliance with the, our, our, our procedures. Making sure that we have uh, the social distancing, make sure the masks are done, all the steps we're doing, we're doing the proper cleaning. That's the thing that keeps us safe. We've had a few small issues that we've had to resolve, but the, the uh, on-site reviews we've done and the video reviews look really good, guys. And I've got to tell you, I appreciate how, how, how you've done such a great job of, of, of making this uh, something we take seriously. It, it's no joke for anybody, and it's something we cannot play with. And I truly appreciate the work that you've done on this. We just got to keep doing it. There's nothing there that, uh, that makes us believe that there's anything less uh, uh, of a risk today than there was before. So we're just going to have to keep doing this until, uh, we, until we learn otherwise. The one issue that did come up and we're going to change policy on, we're in the middle of the heat and we've had a few shift supervisors uh, who brought it up, but it's pretty obvious there's a lot of heat. We've got to stay hydrated. And I've, I've been discussing this with, with John and Brenda, and we are going to change the policy to allow, uh, allow you to bring in a bottle of water or a thermos or something that has a, a cover on it, no open containers. And uh, I, I won't go beyond that with open containers. Not, uh, closed containers you can bring into the classroom or out of the machine room and uncovered long enough to, to get a drink and do what you need to do. 
and uh, get a little hydration going on. But uh, we think it's, uh, we believe that to be quite safe as long as we don't allow that to be a slippery slope to leaving the mask on to having conversations and, and doing other things. Take it off long enough to, to do your drink and, and then put the mask back on. That's uh, something that we're, we're gonna allow. And I'll, I'll put out something uh, so that the members know the same thing. The same policy exists, so on no, no uh, uh, food or beverage out in the machine room. Still has to be in the shop and we have to keep our distance when you take off the mask. So any questions on that, guys? Okay. Uh, second thing that uh, has come up, uh, Dana mentioned it to me today and a couple others have, have talked to me about it before, uh, about the locks on the bandsaws. When we put the locks on the bandsaws, we were having crazy problems with bandsaw blades breaking and things getting, uh, they were just being abused, particularly the resaw blades. Uh, I think we brought that pretty well into control and I believe and several others, Dana believes, Rick believes that uh, we can uh, keep those, the, the, the two smaller bandsaws, uh, not the resaw, but the other two unlocked and just ask the shift supervisors to keep an eye on it and make sure that we have uh, uh, the proper usage. But so they don't have to keep running up to you to get the, the shop, uh, get the saws unlocked and we don't have to keep messing around with that. We'll go ahead and take the locks off those two, uh, two saws. Uh, Mary, I think you've got the shop in the morning, don't you? Uh, tomorrow, would you take those two locks off and put them on my desk? Yes, no problem. Okay, thanks, Mary. Um, if you're not aware of it, we've added a, an exhaust fan into the, the classroom. Uh, and it works really quite well. It's not loud, so you don't know that it's on most of the time, but it sits up in the ceiling and it moves a lot of air out of the, out of the top. The switch for it's right across from the badges by the aprons. And a lot of times you're not gonna know that if that, if that uh, fan is on or off. We haven't yet put a light on that switch so that you can tell. Uh, Rick is working on that project and sooner or later we're gonna figure out a way to get to Get enough wire through that conduit to uh, to be able to get the uh, the light in. But in the meantime, we're leaving the windows open in the classroom, the high windows, so we get that heat out of the top. And during this the summer months, uh, I I urge you to leave that fan on day and night. That that fan draws relatively low power. It's it, it's high volume, low pressure fan. It's only drawing a um, about an amp or an amp and a half. It's a very relatively small motor that's moving the, the air, low pressure, but high volumes through there. So it's not costing as much to run it, but it has made a huge difference in keeping our classroom much more comfortable than, than it would otherwise have been. So if you see that fan on, you can look up in the ceiling, you'll see the louvers are either open or closed. Uh, those open up automatically when, we, when you turn on the fan. Uh, I urge you to just leave that on. If it's hot in there, you might just take a look and make sure that uh, that, that fan's on and uh, that we are exhausting that heat out of the top of the building. Okay. Um, new members. Um, our shop membership was a, a high watermark of a, about, uh, Sharon, help me out, was it about 375, 380? Let's see if we can get her in her full voice into this. She's not, she's still muted. There you are, Sharon. Yeah, our high was 378. 378, okay. Well, I was right in the ballpark. Yep. And now we've had uh, some members who have moved on, some normal attrition. Unfortunately, one or two members have passed away. Um, we're, we're down now uh, several members. So we're going to, for the foreseeable future, try and keep our shop membership at about that 375 mark. We're not gonna go above that during, until we can uh, have more people in the shop. We want our members to all have access to the shop. So we're gonna hold it to about 375. You're gonna to begin to see some new members come in. We'll be asking those of you who are sponsors to help us with the, the training on those. But <clears throat> a couple of things I want you to be aware of with that. First of all, 
uh, we have a huge demand for access to our shop. I think, um, and Sharon or, or Nancy can tell me for sure, but I think it's about 70 or 80 people we have on the wait list. Is that right, Sharon, Nancy? Mm -hmm. that, is that about right? Yeah, about 70. And so and these are people who've been waiting to join. Uh, we're be beginning to now um, see if they're serious and see if they're ready to join. But along with this, with the, the new members, we're really making it very clear that with membership and joining the shop comes the responsibility to be a volunteer. And so before they join and before we agree to take them into the shop, uh, Gary and I are, are meeting with them via Zoom before they, before they even pay, making sure it's real clear that they have uh, uh, an understanding, appreciation, and a commitment to do their part to help run the shop. So we'll be, uh, we'll be emphasizing that. We'll be asking many of you to pair up with some of these new members and uh, uh, help them with some assignments and tasks that uh, we'll be asking them to take on. We wanna get them started in their volunteer activity shortly after they join. We don't want that to be a, a long period of time beyond. If you come up with tasks that you think would be a good assignment, things that might be a few hours a month for somebody to do. You know, like Paul Duffield's been taking care of the retail items, taking care of filling the, the uh, dominoes and getting those put in the rack and putting the sandpaper up. Well, Paul's doing a million other things. That's a good thing for another member to be doing. Uh, there's filing to be done. There's numbers of tasks, certainly with holiday gift build and uh, the tool leads may have some things where they need to have things organized or documented. Uh, if you have some tasks like that, some things that, that, uh, that we can uh, be asking some of our new members to take on as an as a initial responsibility, bring those forward to Sharon, Rick, or I, and we'll see to it that the new members get, get those assignments going. Uh, Gary, do you have anything you want to add about that? Uh, just that we can really use your um, help also in um, encouraging existing members to become more involved. And uh, we've got some acute needs right now. We've got a lot of things going the right direction, but there's some, some holes that are going to be appearing in the dike here. Uh, turns out Doug Lesnar really is serious about going to Ohio, and there actually is a house back there. And one of these trips, he's not probably not going to come back from. So we need a new special projects manager. We really need a, a personnel type person to administer what Dallas just got through talking to you about as we uh, interview these new members and pair them or begin to identify potential areas where they might want to volunteer. We need somebody to keep track of all of that and follow up on it and make sure that they actually do get involved as volunteers. So um, please keep your ear to the ground and think about it. And when you see somebody in the shop that's using the shop and you know they're not volunteering, that's really not okay anymore. And it's uh, time we, we all start to encourage them to get involved. Uh, and it's for their own good as well as for the shops, because as all of you know, the reason you're here is because you find it rewarding to be a part of, of operating the shop. And we want everybody to feel that way and, and do their part. And of course, if everybody does, it's just a lot easier for everybody. So any help you can give us are much appreciated. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Gary. So just one clarification. So if somebody offers to make a second item and donate it, is that considered volunteer hours? That's a, that's a volunteer effort too, yes. Okay, thanks. That's one more way to volunteer. Um, closing checklist. We put that checklist together on how to close up the shop. And we've got it hanging back there in the back. And uh, I had to knock the dust off it the other day when we're, we took a look at it. Uh, it's obviously not getting used very much. But when I take a look at on the on the video, I can see that that you are doing the closing properly and you're doing going through all the steps, uh, even though you're not documenting it that way. <clears throat> and <clears throat> excuse me, my voice is cracking. Um, and so I appreciate that. And we're not trying to make, create a checklist just to have bureaucracy. 
but it was a good way for us to, do, to go forward with it. So what we're going to do in, in view of the fact you're not using it anyhow, we're gonna make it, make it official. We're gonna keep the checklist back there and we're going to have it for those shift supervisors and people who don't close regularly as an aid for you to go back and use to, when you go around and, and do your uh, closing. For the experienced shift supervisors have done it a million times, you've got your routines and I can see that you're doing the closing properly. And so uh, just know that the checklist is back there and, uh, and encourage anybody who's, I encourage anybody who's brand new you will mess up if you don't have that, that checklist to begin with. But uh, for the experienced guys, I get it and it's working. Um, <clears throat> then the last thing I wanted to touch on was the shift supervisor's log. Um, Jim McGeehan and Rick have, have done a lot of work, but Jim McGeehan has just done a fabulous job of putting together both our web page and uh, as a part of that, the uh, shift supervisor log and the, and the tool maintenance log, the, all the, those, those integrated tools have been put together. That's really nice, it's really worked well. Um, and I wanna just share with you a couple of things. First of all, with the new web page, you see that the shift supervisor's log is on the, uh, on the home page. We've got, it's, it's right there on the, in the home page and you can click on the member shop and you see it drop in. Uh, now, Jim, I, see, I don't see you on my screen, but I know you're, there you are. Uh, Jim, you want to comment about the new location? Oh, it's just a matter of, um, we need to, to, to keep that number of uh, entries on the top line down a bit. We're going to need room for the holiday sale and so forth. So we dropped the uh, shift, I think I'm calling it something different now, if that's okay, uh, shop operations, down under the member shop. It's down at the bottom of the member shop list. So it's still there, public, but uh, not as prominent, that's all. Okay. So thank you, Jim, for doing that. Just be aware that it's a little different than what you may have seen before, but using that shop log really makes a difference. When you document the problem with the tool or anything else that you, you want to communicate with uh, the rest of the shift supervisors and the leadership, uh, you want us to respond quickly, putting it on that log uh, makes a difference. If you tell us we're out of uh, toilet paper or paper towels or we're running low on uh, we, we, you put the last blade in the, in the saw and that's sharpened. We need to get the blade sharpened again. That alerts Dwayne and, and Rick and I, and we, we get on it. We make sure that we have all the, the things we need and, and you're getting the, uh, action much faster. So please use the shift log for, for, um, for your documentation. It really does make a difference. Anybody having any difficulty using the log? Okay, well, don't be, don't be bashful about putting things in there. That does make a huge difference. Uh, Sharon, you've got a couple items you wanted to discuss? Not much. Um, there are a couple of gaps in our shift supervisor schedule. Temporarily, we have a gap on every other Thursday evening from 5 to 9 because Mike McElhaney can't keep himself from getting into trouble. So until he's recovered and can resume his shift, we need people to step in there. So, and every other Thursday from 5 to 9 p.m. And when Doug leaves after Thanksgiving, um, then his spot will be open on Thursday morning. So if anybody wants to move, their current shift to something else, just keep that in mind that we have openings or will have openings. And the only other thing I wanted to mention, since we do have a number of new shift supervisors, is just to remind people that you're not supposed to be working on your own projects during your shift time, unless it's a project that you know, in, is furthering shop maintenance. You're working on something for the shop. I hear anecdotally that now and then that rule is not being adhered to. Well, we're, we begin to crack down on that a little bit. I've had to talk to a couple people. Let's just stay, keep in mind that our first job is to keep an eye on 
what's happening in the shop. And if you are doing something, even if it's for the shop, and it detracts from your ability to pay attention to what's going on there, don't do it, guys. We just can't afford that sort of a, of a, a risk. Uh, Rick. Mike raises, is raising his hands. Who is? Hi. I just wanted to let you know that the, uh, <clears throat> the news of my demise has been somewhat exaggerated. Um, I'm, uh, I'm doing quite well. I had an injection the other day in the shoulder, and uh, the, the, uh, the cuff is coming back, and uh, I'm working in the shop all day, so I think I'm going to miss one more week, and I'll be back uh, on the Thursday night bit, and we'll go from there. And I'd like to attest to the fact that uh, Mike McElney is at least back in terms of being able to text. So far today, I think I've received nine from him. Among them are five <laughs> pictures of butterflies and trivets. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> what else could there be? All right. Okay. Rick? Yeah. I just want to tool leads, you know, all but one of the tool leads are shift supervisors. And it's, it's pretty cool uh, just how everybody takes ownership of, of their, their, their piece of equipment or group of equipment. And the shop log and giving people a, ha a heads up on that was really helpful. So, you know, facilitating, you know, timely repair and, uh, and just uptime, you know, generally keeping it's sort of amazing if you if you like all the uh, the tools running when you show up, you know. And once in a while, the out of service list will have a few on them, but you know, rest assured, somebody saw that and is, is moving forward on that. Um, but Jim, that's thank you, and uh, all the ship supervisors that use that. Uh, if you have any concerns about that or are not familiar with it, I'm covering that. I'm going to talk to everybody here, you know, over the next few weeks in the summer, just to make sure people are comfortable using it. I've, I've caught up to 12 or 13 so far. Um, and, you know, one or two, you know, hadn't used it just because of familiarity, but it's, it's not hard. It's really simple. Uh, and it really does add to the shop, you know, the quality of the shop operations. The, uh, Let's see. We do have a uh, with the lathes. We have a, a tool lead for the lathes. James Huffinger. There's Pete, and he's not. A, he's sort of a new guy. Technically, he's not even lathe qualified, but he's mechanical and willing to do that. I need to need to find somebody, Doug, to uh, help get him lathe qualified. Uh, but we'll get that. What's his name again? Pete. Uh, H U F F A K E R. It's James Huffaker. Hey, Rick, if he's uh, not a Turner, uh, we've been talking with Larry about coming back and doing a platter class and a, a basic turning class in the not too distant future. And maybe if we wanted to sponsor him in that class, it'd be a way to get him certified on the basics of turning. Yeah, I think. Isn't he already a Turner? He's just not been certified? Yeah. Got it. Got it. Yeah. So okay. we just need to get him through the through the drill. Um, so that's on my list to to get that get that done. Who, do, um, who does our our latest certifications? <laughs> <laughs> it was Thanks for asking. Uh, it was John. We volunteer for that. It was we did we have been using uh, the the usual suspects, which is Doug. Uh, Doug has been doing it, and we've had uh, John Rieger used to do it, but he's been out of it for a bit. Okay. And then beyond that, it's been uh, just being done by uh, uh, Larry when he does the class. But uh, we really need somebody to take care of the lathe certifications. I, I have not been able to recruit anybody for that yet. Okay. Uh, I've been doing lathe for since 1980. Uh, I'm, I'm fairly good at it. Um, I'd be happy to, uh, to lead some people into that path of self-destruction that uh, will mess your shop up and leave ships everywhere. And 
I've always got a chip on my shoulder, so I'm willing to help. Well, we want to we want to get the ones who aren't heading down to a path of self destruction. <laughs> We're trying to weed those out. Okay. We can talk later about that. Um, um, if I uh, if, if we need to, Mike, I'll reach out for 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 Pete, but uh, we'll see. Okay. Um, um, anything else, Rick? The I'm also gonna touch base with all the shift supervisors. Uh, I've caught up to quite a few about just making sure everybody's comfortable with the saw stop cartridge change. Um, you know, quite a few are, you know, some aren't and just sit down and, and spend time and, and just physically change one and look at it and understand how its operation so that you're, uh, you know, you're, you're comfortable with it. But it's not hard. It's just seems exotic and but it's actually pretty straightforward uh hey else? rick yes i have a question about that sometimes it is hard because that spring when it fires it holds it pushes the arbor of the of the blade uh, you know against the saw and it's really hard to get it off is there an easy way to compress that spring so that that's easier to do or is it uh you have to reset you have to take it the full lower take the saw to full lower and that resets uh, something in there i'm not sure exactly but you, you, you take it all the way down uh, we'll, we'll take this one offline but you're talking about after a cartridge fires uh jerry right the cartridge fires and that's at the big heavy spring that pushes the uh the, the mechanism into the blade to stop it. And while that spring is still pushing the blade against the arbor, which makes the, the whole assembly hard to remove because you got to pull it off the blade and the cartridge together. And it's kind of the spring is preventing you from doing that easily. Okay, well that, that's after a, after a cartridge fire. What we're interested in making sure all the shift supervisors know how to do is, is to properly change and set up a blade. Um, I saw Jim shaking his head saying, Jim Strong saying, no, it's not an easy thing. But uh, after one's gone off, we'll leave that one to, to Jim and Rick and you and Dwayne to, to kind of work through that. We don't need all the ship supervisors to, to know how to. Hopefully we don't have much. Fire. Yeah, we don't want a lot of experience on that. <laughs> sure. And just as a side note, I, I talked to Trent at SawStop and he told me how to do all that, so. I can catch everybody up on that at the appropriate time. Jim, do you have a comment? Strong? No, it's not not difficult. You just have to, you don't do it often enough to remember the steps. And That's the biggest- a, That'd be the way that we want to be. Orient it all the way down, you know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hey guys, a question, there's Alan. no shame in admitting you don't know how to change that blade or, or the uh, cartridge. Please, if you're not comfortable with that, reach out to, to Rick and Dwayne and ask for some instruction on it. We had one cartridge fired because it wasn't changed, it was changed improperly. And uh, they'll go to you quicker, uh, faster if you, if you reach out, they'll hook up with you and get you some real practical experience in doing it. So contact Rick or, or Dwayne and, uh, and ask them to, uh, to give you a little hands-on instruction. If you're not absolutely comfortable, don't guess on that one. So, so the bottom line is uh, you, 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 you pull, take the blade all the way down and that relieves the pressure of the spring to make it easier to take it all off. Yes. Stems nodding, is that true? Yes. It, it can and sometimes it doesn't. And then if it doesn't, then you have a whole other procedure. Because yeah. basically sometimes the blade actually the brake actually goes in and locks with the blade, it becomes one unit. And that's when you have a different procedure to remove the blade and the brake unit at the same time. That's okay. too hard okay. to explain well, you right just, now. You, you just broke into something now. What is all that stuff behind you that you've made? What, are the, what is that project behind you? Uh, that's just uh, photos of some birdhouses that I made. Oh, this is a, is that a, uh, you have a green screen or something behind you? That's your? Yeah. They look that's huge. Just, that's just my background. They're not that big. 
just a photo of Dwayne. They look as big as you. Yeah, they're not. They're probably about 12 inches tall, 14 okay. inches. Okay, <laughs> they look like they're four or five feet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Rick, are you done? Yes. Um, Dallas, can I add something on what Rick was saying? Sure. Um, just re let me share the screen for a second. Um, if I, I'm not sure you see the right screen now. Do you see the, uh, there you go, member shop page screen? Thank you. Are you yes. Okay, I just want to point out that uh, now when, we, it's been happening all along that when you update the log, it updates the out of service, but we haven't shared that with the user community. And Rick and I coordinated on this in, earlier this week and decided to start putting it out there where everybody can see it. So when you put an entry in that says that the out of uh, service status is out of service or limited, it gets posted here so people coming into the shop can check it before they come in. Um, so just bear that in mind when you make your entries. Okay. That's really a handy thing, and that's something that uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll ask Gary for a little help on with the, uh, the update so our members know that they can check the status of any piece of equipment before they come in. Right. That's a handy thing for them. Thank you for putting that up, Jim. And that automatically is populated when a shift supervisor takes something out of, out of uh, service or, oh, yeah, if they, or the, if they put it in limited service. Or the tool they need, either one, yeah, exactly. Great. Okay, guys, um, that concludes the things that we had to cover. Are there some things that you wanted to discuss or any issues that you wanted to raise? Suggestions, ideas? Now, if we were at the shop, every one of you would be talking. Is it because I have you on mute? Hey, Dallas, I, I have one thing if I could. Sure, Doug. So uh, Gary has gone through great efforts to clean up the garage mm. and we would like to try to keep that locked up as much as we could. Uh, the holiday build takes up a large portion of that, but there is still some shop equipment in there like the vacuum press and whatnot. So there may be a need to get in there, but he's went through great efforts to really clean up that garage that's been atrocious for a couple of years, to be honest. So we would like to try to ask shift supervisors to keep that locked up and not to use it as a drop off for leftovers for everybody's projects. If you could, please. Thank you. Amen to that, Doug. Thank you. And uh, along that line, the uh, we're going to move the lays that are out from underneath the benches, that bench out there in the back. I'm uh, going to get those moved out and move the vacuum press out of there. And uh, Gary's asked me to, you know, that other stuff that's hanging there in the wall above the vacuum presses, you know, figure out how to make that gone and, you know, clean it out a little more. So, understood. What are you going to do with the lathes, the two, the two jets? Going to put them on some just short wheels so we can just slide them over. You went dead on us there, Rick. Uh, okay. We're going to just put them on some little short wheels so we can just scoot them over along the wall in the lathe area out of the way. They'll be readily accessible, Mary. Okay. Yeah. Are, are the stands going to be tall enough that they can be used right on those stands? No, no. Okay, okay. It'll be the same situation. It'll just be a little easier to move back and forth. We'll just be able to scroll them away in a corner. Okay. One of the reasons that we built that storage area when we first opened the shop was to give members a place to leave projects in the glue-up stage overnight or if they were coming back the next day to work, they could leave their materials and stuff. And over time, we've accumulated so much crap in there, there's no longer any room to do that. Well, we're almost back to the point where there is now room. So be aware of that, that if a, a member, you know, is gonna be back the next day to uh, 
finish a project or to take the clamps off the glue up or whatever, you're welcome to let them in there and use that area uh, for that now, because that is one of the reasons we, that exists. That Can brings up someone? something on the, on the glue up. Um, people are leaving their glue ups on the workbenches. We we're, we're, don't have a lot of workbenches, so if people are going to, I would hope that if we could get people leaving glue ups to put them out of the way instead of leaving them on benches. Well, I mean, that's why that's one of the reasons we want to get that place cleaned up so they can do that, and and you should now have that available to you. You're right, Dana. We need we can't afford the bench space tied up like that. In the past, when I've been a uh, shift supervisor, if someone has wanted to uh, leave a glue up, uh, I ensured that they were going to be back in the, f the following morning to take it up, pick it up, put it away, or do something with it. Um, and I would say all shift supervisors, that'd be a wise thing to do. If someone does leave something there, they're responsible to get back and get it taken care of before the next group comes in. If they don't leave it on the benches, it would be better to start with because even if they come at the at the first, I, I think that ju just not having them leave it on the benches would be a, a big plus. Okay, Dan, thank that, you. That's up to the supervisor. Just tell them to get it off. As soon as the clamps are on it, get it off the bench. It doesn't have to be on the bench when it's clamped up. Okay. All right. Good point. Good. All right. Dallas, I got a question. Yeah. Um, so uh, I've been in the shop lately, but um, how is the whole um, dust collector system working now? Um, is the dust is the filling up of the drums under control? Uh, are people using the, the blast gates properly? Uh, can you just kind of review that a little bit? Well, the recent past has been excellent. Uh, I've got to say that uh, we've been doing a much better job with blast gates. I've been spot checking that and I occasionally we'll go in and we'll find uh, uh, a bunch of blast gates open, but it's getting to be more and more of a habit for both the members and the shift supervisors to close them. And we're doing a much better job of emptying the bands. We, uh, we do have that alarm on there, but th that uh, light, uh, Flashing is a, a last minute warning, but I truly don't believe that has gone off for a long time because it's getting emptied quite frequently. Now, anybody else have a different opinion? Any? I, I, I would ask that if somebody's using the joiners and the planers, just pay extra, you know, if they're chewing through a bunch of lumber, a bunch of wood and milling it up, just pay extra attention. Yeah. Well, I think we've covered this before, but there's nothing that says that that uh, members can't help you empty those barrels, particularly if they're the ones, you know, generating the sawdust that's filling them out. So uh, don't be bashful about asking them to help you uh, empty those. For sure. Uh, I'll throw my two cents in. I think they should be emptied if they're a quarter full because to huff up a larger trash bin is tough on young and old acts. So, uh, and, um, you know, I mean, I had thought at the end of the shift they should just get emptied by rule of thumb. And be honest with you, this old man is too old to be lifting 50 gallon drums by himself anyhow. So whoever happens to be there definitely helps me. <laughs> it's a way to do it, Dave. Okay. Other issues, guys? Alice, hey, did you want to did you want to talk about the electrical thing or, or just let that go? Uh, I'll just mention that it did happen. We had an incident with uh, Dwayne had the shift on Saturday uh, afternoon, and we had a power failure uh, about three thirty, I think it was Dwayne, uh, sometime in there, and. Uh, we thought it was within, a, it had multiple buildings or multiple units within our building that, that failed. Uh, as it turned out, uh, I got down there, Rick came down and we, we ultimately discovered that uh, we had a breaker tripped in the transformer room, which is down the way, you know, nothing that you would have access to. 
We have no idea why it tripped. Uh, I'm going to be doing a little further investigation with the building manager and, and others to see if we can identify the cause. There was no extraordinary loads at all. It's not like we've got air conditioners in our building or anything else, but we don't have an, a, an underlying cause of why that trip that gives me a little heartburn that we may have it happen again until we can identify the real underlying cause. So nothing for you to worry about, but if it does happen, boy, call Rick, call me, uh, and we'll, we'll get on it right away. Hopefully we'll figure out the problem before we have a recurrence. So did the saw stop? Yeah, I, was, I thought, pardon me? Go ahead, Paul. Did the saw stops trip upon power loss? Uh, well, the part of the saw stops were not even in use according to what I understood. Oh, Ford dodged that Ford, bullet. Between you there? I thought we had a key to the electrical equipment room. We do, but you have to know what to work, what to do with it once you get there. So, okay. Yeah, neither one of the table saws were in use when it happened. Uh, so you know they didn't fire, and when power came back, no issue. Yeah, it would be a design flaw if they would fire on a power outage. Oh. Nancy, did you have something? You looked like you were getting ready to say something a minute ago. Yeah, I had a question. I put it in the chat, but it was about the uh, tool sale. Uh, how do we handle people buying the tools in the tool sale and stuff like that? Okay. Um, <clears throat> the good news is most of the things have already sold, but we'll be having sales on tools uh, off and on. We still have... Uh, uh, I think we've got a couple of air compressors left. And the spindle sander, I think, is still there. <clears throat> but the way you handle a tool sale is you just simply take the money and uh, give them the tool, let them take it away, and you record what who bought what. You know, they bought a uh, Nancy bought a uh, a spindle sander, it's one hundred seventy five dollars, and you mark it down and put it in the envelope of my desk. Just that simple. Great, thanks. We're working on uh, something with our treasurer, with uh, <clears throat> Gary to uh, Gary, our treasurer, to uh, set up a PayPal account so we can pay for some of these things on PayPal. We order to handle the same handle cash all the time, even for like domino sales and other small things. But uh, that's not set up yet. So right now it's cash or check. Okay. Other Can questions, guys, or any comments? I have a question on the tool sales. Do we not have to worry about sales tax on those? That's an issue that uh, our treasurers are working through right now, uh, both the holiday sale and the, and the tool sales. But for right now, no, don't worry about it. But it's a good question. It's a technical question that the CPAs are working through right now. <clears throat> OK. I just have one quick thing uh, am I on you're on Jim okay uh, Travis was bringing up lumber cycle and this is a project that I made and will be making them in the toy class it's a wooden mallet made entirely of wood out of lumber cycle so cool. Tuesday we'll be making these uh, weighted mallets and I think it's a pretty good project and, uh, and I like to do different things in the toy class we don't always make toys we do other things too so Something different. So what's the species you have there? Maple and red gum eucalyptus. And the red gum eucalyptus is harder than crazy. Really? Yeah, it is really extremely. I have a stack of blades. I'm getting sharp after this. I mean, <laughs> but yeah. you can do anything with this thing. And it's got BBs in the center of it. Cool. So. To get that ought to get you into the, get get some people enticed to come into the the toy build. Yes, I hope you see all all of you on Tuesday. Okay, that's it. Okay, okay, guys. Uh, not seeing anything else. I want to thank you again for spending part of your Sunday evening with me and for all the wonderful work you do day in and day out. You've heard Travis, you've heard Gary, and others. Thank you for the work you do. I also want to add my voice to that. I know how much time and effort and energy it takes 
I also know the joy that goes that I get from doing it. But I can tell you that without you, without what you do, we would be nowhere near where we've been and where we're headed. So okay. with that, well, thank you, guys. I noticed that I can call Dallas five times a day, and he has no problem with that. So everybody, call Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> Mike does it. <laughs> okay, guys, thank you. Bye. Bye.